Hey guys, welcome back to Chemistry 1032 Instructional Videos. I am your host, Dr. Russell Betts, and I'll be guiding you through 8.2 Formations of Solutions. Now, solutions come in two basic types, unsaturated and saturated. Now, in organic chemistry, these words mean uh, has a double bond, doesn't have a double bond. That's what it kind of means in organic. In regular, just regular run-of-the-mill chemistry, um, unsaturated simply means a solution can hold more solute. An unsaturated solution can hold more solute. It has not achieved its maximum amount of solute it can dissolve. A saturated solution has achieved its maximum amount of solute that it can dissolve. Let's imagine a vat of Kool-Aid. Who doesn't love Kool-Aid? You add sugar. One cup. One Kool-Aid pack, half gallon of water. That's how you make Kool-Aid. It's been 20 years or 30 years since I made Kool-Aid, but I still remember how to do it. Now, you add the cup of sugar, and you drink it. And you discover that the Kool-Aid tastes pretty good, but you know as a 8 or 9 year old child, it could taste better. How do you make it taste better? You add another cup of sugar. Right? Makes perfect sense. So the first cup dissolved. The second cup dissolved. So that means when I had my first cup of sugar, just one cup in there, that solution was unsaturated. How do I know? When I added the second cup, it dissolved as well. So the original solution, the one cup solution, was not saturated. It was unsaturated saturated, which means it can hold more solute. Now, because you're, you know, you're eight years old now, you say, well, if two cups of sugar are good, a third cup of sugar is better, right? Because, you know, you're eight and your mom's not looking. Now, what happens? You add that third cup of sugar to that <laughs> Kool-Aid. What happens? Well, all that sugar starts to conglomerate on the bottom, doesn't it? Now, for sure, your mom is going to catch you now because you've added a third cup. And that third cup didn't dissolve. You stirred it all you want. Stir it for hours. It won't dissolve. Why is that? Because you've achieved what's called a saturated solution. The water has actually dissolved all the sugar it can. It cannot dissolve another, another even an ounce, not even a molecule, because it's saturated with solute. Oh, your mom's going to catch you for sure, and you're going to get in trouble. So you better drink that Kool-Aid fast. <laughs> All right. So now, solubility also depends on temperature. So as an eight-year-old child, I never would have thought of this, but now as an adult, I would have said, well, if all that sugar won't dissolve, what should I do? I should just warm it up. You should just take that Kool-Aid and put it in the pot and increase the temperature. Just warm the Kool-Aid up. It would actually dissolve all that sugar. And, you know, for a time, the water, the, the sugar that you dissolve by warming it would stay in solution for a little while, kind of like honey. These are called supersaturated solutions. When you take, when you take a, a liquid past its solubility point at room temperature by heating it, you dissolve more solute than you should be able to, right? They're called supersaturated. And then when you cool them down, a lot of times the solid that you dissolved, the extra solids that you dissolve will actually come out of solution. That's called being, that's called precipitation. All right. Now you've seen this with sugar. If you let sugar sit in your cabinet long enough, you'll see that it'll eventually sugar, what they call sugar out, where all the, the honey sugars will actually precipitate, make a solid. And all you got to do is warm it back up in an, under hot water and the sugar will re-dissolve into the honey. Okay. Because honey is a super saturated solution of sugar. Now, gases are the opposite. The solubility of gases in solution in water decreases with temperature. So if you if you increase the temperature on a on a water, it'll dissolve less gas, which is kind of neat. That goes the opposite of solids. Eight point three. Strong electrolytes, ionized, non electrolytes, and weak electrolytes. First of all, what's an electrolyte? 
everyone's always saying they need electrolytes. What's an electrolyte? So let me let me just say it for you. An electrolyte is a dissolved ion in water. An electrolyte is a dissolved ion in water. It's a dissolved ion in water. There you go. That's an electrolyte. Now, a strong electrolyte, such as, let me think of one, sodium chloride is a good one. I put an S there because I'm talking about solid sodium chloride. Is put into water. And you'll get Na plus. Plus Cl minus. Aqueous. Aqueous. Solid. So here we have sodium chloride is added to water. So far so good. It'll generate sodium plus cations and chloride negative anions, but no sodium chloride parent molecule. Let me illustrate that here. So here's like a beaker of water. Here I am with a salt shaker. Putting some salt in there. Just shake some salt in there. When the salt hits the water, it will become Na plus Cl minus. Na plus Cl minus. Na plus Cl minus. Na plus Cl minus. Now, it's just, they're just going to spread themselves out in solution. Okay? What we have here is a whole bunch of ions dissolved in water. But look, nowhere in that beaker do you see any NaCl molecule. The parent is gone. It's completely gone. It's what we call dissociation. The sodium chloride completely dissociates. That is to say, it breaks apart from being a molecule and forms ions in water. And that is a strong electrolyte. Any compound that dissolves in water and ionizes completely is a strong electrolyte. Sodium chloride, potassium chloride, potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, they all ionize completely in water. And they're all strong electrolytes. Okay? Now let's look at this uh, equation. Notice the arrow. It's only pointing in one direction pointing to the right. That means this is a strong electrolyte because we started out with a solid. See that? It's not aqueous. The sodium chloride is not aqueous. That's an important thing to remember. It's not aqueous. This and this, the products, are aqueous and charged. They have charges. This is a strong electrolyte. The parent molecule is not aqueous. The arrow points only to the right. Strong electrolyte. And here's another example of a strong electrolyte. Magnesium chloride. It's going to be solid. Dissolves in water. Aqueous. And this also would be aqueous. Okay? Strong electrolyte. The arrow points only in one direction. So it's going to be a strong electrolyte. Now there's also these things called non-electrolytes. Now you have to remember, not everything that dissolves in water is ionic. Not everything that dissolves in water will ionize. In fact, a lot of things don't, including sugar. Sugar will not ionize in water. So, sugar would be considered a non-electrolyte. It's still dissolved in water, no question. But it didn't form ions. Didn't form ions. Okay? Now let's go back one slide. Two slides. Notice here, this is a strong electrolyte solution. Strong electrolyte solutions can conduct electricity very well. Okay, so electricity can flow through a strong electrolyte very well. Here's a non-electrolyte, sugar in water. The light doesn't turn on because non-electrolytes cannot conduct electricity. Okay, now here's a weak electrolyte. We haven't talked about what that is yet. But weak electrolytes are terrible at conducting electricity. But they're better than non-electrolytes. So that's why the light is dim, not bright. 
Here the light is bright because there's a lot of ions. Strong electrolyte. Not lit at all here. Non-electrolyte. Doesn't collect electricity at all. So there's no ions in solution to carry the charge. The electrical charge. Weak electrolytes. Weak electrolytes are molecules that will ionize slightly in solution. Slightly in solution. Let's put my head down here so you can see these slides better. Now, we have a weak electrolyte, say carboxylic acids, for example. So let's just say what we call acetic acid, which is found in vinegar. There we go. So as you can see, these bad boys are charged and they'll be aqueous. And this will also be aqueous. That's a big, big hint. Also, what you'll see is an arrow going back to the left. So this reaction is what you call reversible. It goes to the right and then it goes back to the left. It's reversible. And all three species are aqueous, which means they're all found in water when you dissolve it. So let's just take our beaker of water again, and let's dump in some acetic acid. And in solution, you'll get a whole bunch of acetic acid plus some H plus plus the ion. Sorry, it's outside the beaker there. You'll get all three. You can't really see that, can you? Let me do that again. Can't really see that orange very well. I'm looking at it now and I can barely see it myself. Let's try red. Uh, let's try blue. Uh, much better. There's the parent acid. And then it's, con it's acid and it's conjugate base. There you go. It's kind of hard to see. It drew a little small, but you get the idea, I hope. All three of these are found in solution, and that's very common of a weak electrolyte, okay? In a weak electrolyte, the parent molecule is most definitely there in solution, and it is almost always the most predominant thing in solution, except for the solvent. Okay, and here's an example of what I was just showing you. Here's acetic acid dissolving in water. That should say AQ because it is dissolved in water. Now you can get acetic acid pure as a pure liquid. It's not vinegar though. Vinegar is acetic acid in water, okay? And uh, that's the end of 8.3. So I'll leave it there and I'll come back and I'll go over 8.4, which is concentration. So now I, I want to wish you guys good luck and good chemistry.